Right, well, thank you for coming this evening. Um, it's, a, it's a great uh, pleasure to be able to describe the work that we do both at the Tau Center and the Brown Institute. Um, over the next, uh, I guess, couple of hours, um, you'll see a little of, of me, a little of Emily, very short, and then um, a lot of the people who are involved in the Institute, people who we've um, supported in some way or provided some, some kind of financial uh, or, or help with in some way. Um, so my name is Mark Hansen. I'm the head of the uh, Brown Institute for Media Innovation. Um, for those of you who don't know who uh, David and Helen Gurley Brown was, um, David Brown uh, was a movie producer making films like Cocoon and A Few Good Men and, of course, Jaws. Um, Awesome. And then um, uh, Helen Curley Brown was the editor of Cosmopolitan Magazine for 35 years or so. Um, uh, uh, a year and a half ago, um, uh, Helen Curley Brown gave a gift of $30 million. Half of it went to Stanford Engineering, half came here um, to endow uh, the Brown Institute, which is, again, half uh, a partnership between Stanford Engineering and Columbia Journalism, uh, stylistically marrying um, technology and content. Um, the, uh, the Brown Institute, um, and, that, and they also happen to be an extremely photographic couple, so you're going to see a number of these pictures of the Browns. Um, I don't even know what the dress makes me think that. But anyway, um, what, what the Browns were, uh, 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 you could ask sort of, situated in a journalism school, the, the Browns understood audience. They were showmen. Um, they understood how to tell a good story. They understood um, what it meant to bring an audience to a story. And that's the kind of spirit that the Brown Institute tries to bring to all of its um, content crossed with technology projects to make sure that at the core of all of them there is a really good story. Um, so uh, the space right below us uh, in a year's time, I'm told, well, less than that actually in June of uh, 2014 will be the Brown uh, Institute space. Um, it was designed by uh, Lewis, or Maki Lewis, LTL um, uh, architects, uh, and they took inspiration from sort of newsrooms, past and present, um, as well as R&D or startup spaces, and created a space that looks a bit like this. Um, I mean, people are a little ghostly here. I'm sure we'll be a little bit more material when it comes to mind. But, um, uh, it's basically just a big open workspace. Um, all, the walls themselves are covered with a kind of scrim that allows you to project a series of projectors in the ceiling that allows you to project on just about any surface. There are a series of um, LED panels in the walls. Um, uh, and then faculty offices, you'll have the digital faculty. This is, by the way, uh, this would be the perspective on the space if you're standing where I'm standing, looking that way, one floor down. Uh, and this is the perspective you'd get if you were standing in the back where the camera is, looking this way, one floor down. Um, and again, it's a, sort of a big open uh, workspace area um, where you're all invited to come hang out. Um, right now, however, it looks like this. Um, so it's a big, open, uh, asbestos-free, however, space, um, should you choose to, I don't know, engage with the, the floor material in ways that... Anyway, um, so, uh, uh, the Brown, so that's the future home of the Brown Institute. Um, uh, on the web, you can find us at brown.columbia.edu. Um, we hired some designers, so this, the, the, the website actually is a little design. Um, what you'll notice over time, and this is completely ancillary to its mission, but um, the, uh, the site will change color according to the different uh, covers of Cosmo magazine, uh, starting from Helen's tenure. This was kind of a nod to her. It, uh, one thing I found out in, we had an intern, a design intern do this, uh, pull all the covers um, from 1965 up until 90. I think. Um, and it was sort of uh, disturbing the number of crochet halter tops you found in the 1970s, but I suppose that's just Cosmo. So um, this is sort of the uh, intent of the site that it will change. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the Brown Institute does. Um, then we're going to trans transition over to the Tau Center, and Emily will talk a little bit about the Tau Center, it's, uh, what it's all about, and some of the projects. And then I'll come back at the end and have about not about, precisely, six five-minute five presentations from people who have um, received support from the Brown Institute to talk about the kind of work that they're doing. Um, so over the last year or so, I, I've been here at the school since uh, uh, August of last year. Gosh, it seems like such a long time. 
Um, uh, and uh, uh, since then, the, the Brown Institute has supported a number of, of efforts, and this will give you a sense of the kinds of work we do. So one of the first events was a, was a Twitter Fiction Fest um, from, uh, uh, sponsored by Andrew, uh, or led by Andrew Fitzgerald um, at Twitter and uh, held at the New York Public Library. Um, we sponsored events in the school. The school has a regular technology breakfast where we talk about technology and journalism, and uh, we pulled together a panel um, uh, uh, for example, uh, on the new face of research and development, where we had the head of R&D at uh, Huffington Post, the head of R&D at the New York Public Library, and the head of R&D at MoMA. I don't know that many of you would know that the Museum of Modern Art had an R&D department, but they were all being interviewed by David Gertner, who's the head of research and development R&D at, um, at uh, uh, oh, sorry, who um, wrote the book, The Idea Factory, which, is, uh, which was on Bell Labs, which is in a way old school r and um, we also help, and you should watch out for these specific events designed to encourage collaboration. Again, we have this sort of stylistic marriage between content and technology. So last year, for example, we had an event up in the Hearst Building called Research Three Ways. I mean, it is Cosmo Magazine after all, so anyway. Um, where the three were um, uh, journalism, technology, and then an institution like the New York Times or AP. Was held up on the 44th floor of Hearst. Uh, oh, look, you can see uh, Fergus there. Um, uh, and Emily. Um, uh, uh, we also uh, sponsored um, last year one, but this year um, at least two uh, hackathons. Last year it was in conjunction with um, Sunlight Foundation using a number of their uh, APIs looking at um, how, uh, looking at, at the influence of money in politics. Um, uh, and team. Um, we also co-sponsored the Computation and Journalism, Journalism Symposium in 2013, which looked at specifically um, the role that computation plays in journalism. And this year, it will be held in our brand new space downstairs, um, uh, I guess, at the end of June. Uh, we will actually take possession of the space in June. Um, and we have a, a role across campus, again, trying to sort of cross art and science, technology, and, and storytelling. We hosted a speed dating event where we had uh, quite literally a long table, long table set up in the world room. Twelve technologists on one side, twelve humanities architects, journalists, Sheila, and um, on the other, and we shifted every five minutes, a la speed dating style. Um, and we couldn't get them to leave when they were done, which made me very happy thinking we'd done something. And, and this was in partnership with the Institute for Data Sciences and Engineering on campus, which um, uh, has a new media committee that is devoted to um, trying to cross engineering and uh, more humanities-based practices. Uh, we also hosted a conference called the Declassification Engine um, that uh, uh, invited a, a, a number of, of experts in the field of official secrecy to come and speak about, um, uh, to, to speak about um, uh, well, in this case, about, about um, a project that we ended up funding, and you'll hear a lot more about it in, in a little bit. Um, coming up this year um, in February, uh, we're have, uh, one of the big events we're, we're, uh, we're sponsoring is a, a, a version of Rhizome 7 on 7. The Rhizome is an art, uh, art uh, producing, um, art supporting organization that's now housed in the new museum. And their seven on seven takes seven technologists and seven storytellers and puts lots of them away for a day um, or two and then comes back and has an event to see what they were able to make. Um, our seven on seven, um, or our version of it, and we still need a nice name, so y'all are the word people, if you can come up with a better name than seven on seven. Um, uh, is our, our version is being sponsored by AOL and um, it will feature seven storytellers and seven technologists that will work for five days or so, which will give us an opportunity to, to drop in the classes and so on um, to see how they're doing. It'll be bracketed at the beginning with a hack event um, sort of around stories and, and storytelling. Um, and the, the people that we're interested in, at least on the storytelling side, we're looking for three or four journalists, um, a couple of filmmakers, and a fiction writer. Uh, and it better be Mark Daniels. Um, so uh, our, uh, 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 the, the institute itself, um, in addition to space and sponsoring events, 
um, offers scholarships. I know that a, num a number of you received um, scholarships this year. Uh, you filled out uh, essays uh, on the way in. Um, we also offer um, fellowships, and you'll hear from uh, our two fellows this year a little bit later. And we offer something called magic grants. This is Helen's language. And you'll find magic grants. There's a magic grant at Smith College. There's about to be a, a series of magic grants offered through the New York Public Library. Um, basically, uh, magic grants are uh, uh, pots of money up to $150,000 um, that support you making something. And speculating on something, building something. You can think of it as seed funding, startup funding to build something. Um, we've had two rounds of, of funding at this point, um, and these are the, the, uh, the uh, uh, names, at least, of the, of, the, of the projects that we've funded so far. And in the second part, when I come back after the Tau Center does its uh, presentation, you'll, you'll hear from a few of the people who have been supported, and it'll give you a sense of what we're looking for. Um, just as an example, one of the, one of the uh, uh, projects that, that um, came from Stanford um, is called Ensemble, and it's about sort of large-scale storytelling. So you can think of it as a platform where someone writing a story can say, you know, I need to find a way to take the character from the bodega to, you know, off to the bus. Have someone write that transition for me. Or, you know, this ending isn't working, can we rewrite the ending? So it's a way for lots and lots of people to collaborate um, and use not quite crowdsourcing, which is on a much larger scale, but kind of a medium scale, uh, uh, medium scale application where numbers of people work together um, to, to craft, let's say, a piece of fiction. Um, and that's one of the. This is one of the projects that we funded um, that we funded this year. Um, all right, so I'm going to hand it over to Emily. Picture. I'm going to hand it over to Emily uh, Bell, who's the head of the Tau Center, and she'll tell you a little bit about the kind of work that they do and the role that they play in the school. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I suddenly realise you're like the first students that I've seen en masse so far this year. It's a slightly shocking, uh, slightly shocking moment. Um, anyway, welcome uh, and thanks for coming along. The purpose of tonight really is to, so that we can meet you, um, the inhabitants of the Brown and Tau centres, and also we can address some of the questions around, so what is it that you actually do, um, which I've been answering now for, for, for three years. Uh, as Mark was saying, um, you know, currently we're both living on the sixth floor. Uh, in the future, there will be we will be living downstairs um, in a lovely space where actually I used to live in the tiny yellow corner uh, right at the end, which has um, been thankfully dismantled. Um, I want to talk about Tower Centre and what we do. Uh, I'll then hand over to our research director, who will uh, tell you exactly what we're doing and producing this year. Uh, I want you also to bear something in mind about Mark and I, which is that we have money. Um, now, I, d I wasn't thinking I had to spell it out, but I'm going to. We have money. This is important because one of the things which we want to achieve at Columbia in terms of changing um, the profession uh, is that we want the involvement of you people uh, in the research and the work uh, and the projects that we do. So that's a really important thing. Often kind of when, when students first arrive at Columbia, they feel maybe a little bit intimidated about what these programs are, about whether or not they can approach us, about how do you actually get the money. Um, often, and one of the reasons we're doing this tonight is that last year we had several people sort of halfway through the year going, oh, but I had no idea that I could uh, actually get funding for this, or I've suddenly had this um, idea that I want to do, I don't know how to, how, who to approach with it, um, and I don't know who has money. So uh, Mark and I, we have money. Be nice to us. Um, so the Tower Centre for Digital Journalism. Uh, who we are? Uh, well, there's me. Uh, I'm director. Uh, I came here three years ago, almost to the day. Uh, before that, I'd spent 20 years um, being a journalist, 22 years being a journalist in Britain, hence the accent. Uh, the last 20 of those 22 years I spent at the, Gu the Observer and Guardian newspapers and the last 10 of those I spent uh, building really the, or I say this grandly as though it was me who was doing it, it wasn't actually, it was a team um, that I was leading building the 
digital presence of uh, The Guardian, which some of you may have heard of, um, it occasionally breaks stories uh, in the digital realm. Um, a question that sometimes asked to me is, well, you know, why are you here? Uh, were you fired by The Guardian? The answer is no. Um, in fact, I still sit on their board, so uh, they, they, they like me enough for that. Um, the reason I came here, uh, and this is, again, is hopefully is instructive, because I think that there's a really good moment uh, right now for journalism schools, um, which is helping the industry figure out what happens next. Um, one of the things that uh, was very clear to me at The Guardian was that we were trying lots of techniques and things for the first time, whether it was you know, back in 2003, putting comments on articles for the first time, whether it was uh, live blogging, which we invented, and I can only apologize to all of, the, all of you who are gonna have to spend your careers now live blogging, because uh, it's a heinous thing to have to do. It's great for the audience, not great for the journalists. Um, but but we, we found that this was a lot of kind of experimentation out of the box. As you grow uh, as a news organization, it's harder and harder to experiment. And when you look at other industries and where they actually get their experiment and their experimentation, their ideas from, you often see that it's through a really close relationship with uh, research universities um, and with schools that sort of focus on, on these things. Journalism schools, um, and you know, including Columbia, are famous all over the world for producing excellent journalists. Uh, but we've got to a point now where I think that we can lead the profession a little bit more than we can follow it, uh, which has always been the case. So I thought for certainly sort of um, from my perspective, coming here uh, and working with people like you uh, is actually sort of the most exciting place to be in journalism at the moment. Um, you may not agree uh, when you're in my class, but we'll see. Um, Professor McGregor, who has had to run off and catch a plane somewhere glamorous because we fly a lot at the Tower Centre. Um, Professor McGregor uh, joined us, uh, Susan McGregor joined us from the Wall Street Journal Interactive team uh, two years ago. Uh, and Susan was the first faculty member we had here who taught data journalism. So, you know, within the past two years, we've really gone from these uh, disciplines being taught sometimes occasionally by adjuncts, etc., to them being a, a core part of uh, the curriculum. Um, Taylor Owen, who joined us a year ago, in fact, happy birthday. Uh, and Taylor, put your hand up. Taylor's down here. Uh, Taylor's an extremely talented um, Canadian scholar uh, who was teaching data visualization um, up at UBC, but actually his background is in technology and human security from an international relations perspective. Have I got it right? Excellent. Um, and Taylor represents, again, one of those uh, individuals who's uh, really leading and, and shaping a, a brand new field, which is about bringing interdisciplinary, um, uh, interdisciplinary skills together and focusing them in a new way. And that's what we're all about, both at the Brown Institute and at the Tau Center, is saying, how can we cross-match computer science and journalism to produce something new? How can we bring in the influence of other fields uh, to the skills of skill sets of journalism uh, and make, some, make something new? We have the wonderful Lauren Mack, who is our uh, research administrator. Lauren, at the back, standing at the back. Uh, Lauren um, is responsible for the food at TAU, at TAU events. Uh, be very nice to her as well. We have money, she has food. Um, <laughs> And then we have Shivani there, who's waving at you, who is our Tau DMA. Uh, and I want you to pay particular attention to this because when you come to Tau events, and hopefully you'll come to a lot throughout the uh, year, and if you attend courses uh, taught by Tau faculty, um, Shiwani is our DMA, and uh, just as we have, uh, I think now, six DMAs in the school who are all graduates, uh, a very special person can come and work um, in the Tau Center uh, and really sort of engage with what we do, help uh, publish and report on the events that we hold, uh, do their own reporting and research around this area. Uh, so if you're kind of interested in that sort of thing, one thing I would urge you to do is get in touch with us, uh, talk to Shuani. We often have 
uh, roles that we want students uh, to participate in, particularly kind of coverage and producing things for the Tau uh, website, which has not been quite as beautifully designed yet as Mark's website, so I'm not going to show it to you. Um, but TauCenter.org is, is where it is. Uh, and we do post very regularly now on not just uh, the research that we're doing, but also you know, relevant news events um, in the outside world. Tau facts. Uh, so we're embedded in the School of Journalism. That means that we are part of it. It's a bit like being uh, in a soldier in a war zone. Uh, it was started three years ago in 2010, and it's funded by the Tau Foundation, who have made none films. Uh, they have published no magazines with uh, crochet halter tops. Um, but they do fund uh, the Tau Night Centre for Entrepreneurial Journalism at CUNY, uh, which involves my good friend, Professor, the real Professor Jeff Jarvis, I suppose the fake Professor Jeff Jarvis. Uh, they are very, very interested in the work that we're doing uh, in terms of bringing sort of technology and journalism together. Uh, with a home for the dual degree in computational journalism, uh, computational science and journalism. Who's here, who is here from the dual degree? Hands up, Ray. Very good. So, so, so probably, about, probably about half the people that we have in the school at the moment who are taking the dual degree. This is a really um, unusual program. Uh, we were the, at the time, we may still be, I'm sort of looking at Dean Gruskin, but he's reading a book. Um, I think we're still possibly, ah, oh, with <laughs> student papers. I, it's, uh, I still, I think it's still the only program uh, of its kind in the world. Is that right, Dean Gruskin? It's the only one that we know of. That's a great journalistic response, isn't it? It's like, I don't know. It seems like it's probably the only one. Um, it's the only one in our forensic search that we've discovered that it's like this. Uh, and we're extremely proud of that. We graduated our last class, uh, our first class last year. Um, uh, and they all found instant and uh, lucrative employment. Um, and we're also home for the Tau Night Projects. Um, now, the Tau Night Projects are new to the school, which is a program of research where we are uh, putting together industry, academic, um, and if you like, sort of ideas from anywhere. But we're trying to pair academics and uh, really the interests of the industry to come up with um, three research areas. And Taylor is going to talk about those in a moment. Um, so he can talk you through those, and then you'll see uh, presentations from a, a, a couple of people doing those, one of whom is um, a former MA student who was in the program last year. So again, keep in mind, there's something that you can get involved with here. There's money, there's, there's money to be spent. We have $2 million of research funding, uh, and it's a multi-year program. So um, come, and, uh, come and talk to us about any ideas that you have. It may be something that you're not ready to do now, but it may be something that we can um, refine uh, and turn into a project over time. Uh, so we teach, we publish research, uh, we convene, um, and we drink tea. Very important. Um, you'll have noticed tea is an enduring theme. Mark has stolen uh, tea because I noticed that Helen Gurley Brown is, was seldom without a cup of tea in her hand. Um, I'm British, so therefore I run on tea. Uh, if you want to actually come and find us physically, we're on the sixth floor here for now. We also have the Tau Fellows um, room, which is a sort of like, we're calling it the hole in the ground. It's, it's actually a very nice basement um, between 115th and Riverside until we move into the facility downstairs. I'm telling you that because we have a yard and a barbecue, and you may be invited if you're nice. Um, at, ooh, hang on. Just on a, on a, on a, oh, there we go. Uh, Trackpads. Um, yes, there we go. So, how to and how to get involved? Um, see our calendar and sign up for the email, which goes out every week, um, because it will tell you what's what's coming up, um, and it will also invite you to propose things. When I say propose an event, ask for a speaker, speaker help us report events, um, and help out on the Tau Centre website. Those are all things that you can and should be doing. And the really important part about this is that if you haven't gathered this already. Uh, New York at the moment is rich in digital journalism and opportunities, and it's a pretty um, vibrant but tight-knit community. We know 
most of the people involved in it, and quite a few of them have circled through the school, either as adjuncts or students um, or visiting lecturers at some point. So the network here is really, really substantial. And if you're interested in this kind of career or you, you want to orient your skills in that way and you're not making uh, full use of being connected in New York City, then you're really missing out. Because you know, if you go to Hacks and Hackers, if you, go to, if you join the ONA, um, if you come to some of our events and, 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 and say hi to the speakers, if you were at the Al Jazeera America Tea earlier on today, uh, these are people who really, really want you know, to meet you as well. So I would say make full use of the network that we, that we offer. Um, and in fact, in our, first, in, in our first iteration, when we first met as the Tau Center, one of our students said, uh, I would like to start a chapter of the ONA. So we do have a student chapter of the ONA here. And I would urge any of you who are not members to join. Um, and then, as I say, uh, think about work that you might want to do beyond your coursework and your reporting. Uh, formulate it into a research proposal and come and talk to me or Taylor about it. And that's exactly what, um, as I say, Fergus, who you'll see in a minute, did uh, about this time last year. Um, and now he's having to execute it. Um, so at that point, I'm, I'm going to hand over to Taylor now. So come on up, Taylor, who's going to talk a little bit about the research program. And uh, you'll hear about a couple of the projects. Awesome. There you go. Thanks. Yeah, that's right. I love the caveat of being Canadian. Being Canadian. I don't know what that means. If it's pejorative, if it's. I'm a colonial. being European, it's a compliment. We're a colonial subject of you, so that's probably part of it. But. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the research projects we're doing, because uh, as Emily said, there's all sorts of ways to get engaged, and there's a bunch of events we're going to be having this year that we hope you'll kind of participate in and benefit from. Um, so just aside from being Canadian and uh, doing my, my own academic work is in um, the intersection of international relations and technology, um, but so if you're interested in that topic, please come and uh, talk to me about it. But what I do here is trying to conceive of these research projects that bring together journalists, practitioner journalists based at institutions broadly defined, so based at startups or based at traditional media institutions, technologists very broadly defined, so everything from data scientists to computational journalists to graphic designers, full broad spectrum of technologists with um, interdisciplinary academics. Um, one thing about journalism is there isn't like an academic discipline of journalism, really. Um, communication studies is to a certain degree, but we wanted to really broaden that scope out. So we have anthropologists as part of it, statisticians, political scientists, sociologists, um, all coming together um, in various configurations in these projects to try and sort of dive into what we think this space of digital journalism is and the impact it's having. Um, the three themes we operate under, which is, is under the sort of stipulation of the grant, is to look at uh, the impact of digital journalism. So how can we measure the impact of a piece of journalism, uh, a piece of digital journalism or of a, a, a site, um, and all sorts of ways of measuring that. Um, transparency, so transparency both on the, on the journalistic side, how can we make the actual process of journalism more transparent, and how can we use certain types of journalism to make the institutions that we are uh, writing about and working on more transparent, um, and data journalism. We're doing a whole host of projects in the area of data and computational journalism, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, so just to give you sort of a flavor of, of the types of projects we're doing this year, um, it's kind of a rolling thing, so we're always adding new projects. This is sort of the slate of what we have right now. Um, the center newsroom is the one that Fergus met, is going to come and speak about. He's running. Um, and here what we're looking at is all the different ways sensors can be deployed as a journalistic news ga uh, data gathering tool. So by sensors, we mean everything from environmental sensors to drones. Um, and we're doing, we've done a big workshop on that, and we're doing a host of experiments that Fergus is going to talk a bit about. Um, the single subject news network, which uh, uh, is being run by two people who are going to speak as well today, Kristen Nolan and Lara Sitrakian. Um, Lara founded uh, Syria Deeply, which is a totally untopical site uh, this month. Um, traffic way down, I'm sure. Um, but uh, what, they, what they came to the, with this idea that what Syria Deeply is, um, is a, a topic, a, a news website that just focuses on one topic. 
And when we started looking around, it, it seems like this is a trend. And we wanted to be able to study this space and figure out um, around the world um, whether there's something in common and whether we, these, these sites that do this in different subject areas can learn something from each other. Um, so they'll talk a bit about that. Um, uh, digital Actives and Digital Journalism is a project that looks at the, the increasing overlap between activism and journalism. Um, so for example, uh, during the G Egyptian uprisings, um, someone, um, would, two people would be doing the exact same thing, saying the exact same thing on the exact same platform to the same audience, and some would be self-identifying as activists and some would be self-identifying as journalists. And we're trying to sort of explore that overlap. Um, digital long form, we're trying to sort of make sense of this new space of digital long form that's emerging. Um, everything from the Atavist to Bylander to Long Reads, um, there's a whole host of them and we're uh, trying to dive into that space. Uh, newsroom Metrics is looking at ways big newsrooms are using tools like Chartbeat um, to measure in real time the, uh, the reach and traffic around stories and how that's affecting the journalistic process, so what the feedback loop is there. Um, open Government Reporting is looking at uh, ways we can be using open municipal data to improve local news gathering and local reporting on, um, on city halls. Uh, Impact Reads is, is a tool being developed to track the movement of an article after it's published, all the ways it's read, all the ways it's spread, in a, in a, in a way to sort of gauge its, its broad impact. Um, Future Online Video is a project that's looking at um, non-traditional video producing news organizations producing video. So what does it mean for the New York Times to get into the video space? Um, why are they doing it? How are they doing it? Um, uh, redesigning the Newsroom is, a, is an act an a visual anthropology project which is looking at how news traditional media institutions are modernizing and redesigning their newsrooms. Um, and data and computational journalism, we have a whole host of projects in this space looking at, um, at this sort of new practice. So that's very broad overview. I wanted to mention three events we're having this fall, kind of big signature conferences we're having um, that are open to everybody and we hope you'll get involved with. Um, one is around the single subject news project. We're bringing uh, 20 of these single subject sites from around the world here together to learn from each other, to talk about this this new space and to kind of define this new space. We'll hear a bit more about that. Um, Susan McGregor is running a, a workshop on operational security for journalists. So how to, it'll be a very practical workshop on how to use encrypted email, uh, how to protect yourself in the field, um, a whole host of very practical um, training sessions on digital security. Uh, and linked to the Digital Long Form Project, we are bringing together basically this whole space. So we're bringing together people in traditional media that are doing innovative things in digital long form and all these new startups that are doing it. So about 30 of these companies will all be coming together uh, to talk about this new space. And they're actually where there's tons of jobs right now. So it's actually, that would be a really strategic one to come to. Uh, aside from that, just if you have ideas for research projects, come and talk to us. Uh, we are constantly, of, constantly building new projects and we're constantly hiring people to be, we're wanting to be hiring people to be working on these projects too. So if any of these are of particular interest to you, to you uh, let me know. Um, so yeah, with that, I will invite Fergus to tell us a bit about the sensor projects. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Is that your phone? Uh, no. Um, hi, yeah, just by way of more introduction, uh, I was, my name's Fergus Pitt, I was in the MA class uh, last year, um, Bill Gruskin was my thesis supervisor, um, and this actually kind of came out of a conversation that um, Emily started in one of her classes, which was about um, how would you be covering um, Sa Sandy and the kind of, the Hurricane Sandy, um, you know, if you were looking over the next five years and the conversation started up about um, well, you know, what's in the water? Um, and, you know, is there a possibility of kind of stringing sensors around New York City or, or other kind of water courses to try and get a little bit more of a granular sense? Instead of just looking at the water and going, oh, that looks a bit gross, is it safe, is it not? You know, is there a way of actually being able to kind of pull out data? Um, so to kind of go from that kind of quite specific example up to a much, much broader um, context for this, um, 
the, the whole stream of work is around sense, asking whether sensors and drones um, can be useful reporting tools and how we can do that well, what do we need to keep in mind, what are the skills, what are the resources, is it kind of a feasible thing. Uh, and the reason, the reason that we think that that might be interesting, um, it's a kind of coming together of three trends in journalism and in the wider world. Uh, one is that data journalism is obviously becoming mainstream. Um, you've got more and more technology kind of, and technologists finding their way into newsrooms. Um, and at the same time, you've got consumer electronics and smartphones and all kinds of technology booming, which means that sensors themselves are becoming cheaper, more ubiquitous. Uh, you can do more with them. You can understand more of the world um, using them. Uh, so that, that makes us think that, you know, well, sensors can be a source of data for journalists. Um, a lot of the data that data journalism uses at the moment is produced by other institutions, whether it's an environmental institution, an economic institution, or something else like that. It's not, it's not always the case, but it's often the case. And so maybe sensors can be a tool for journalists to actually ask the questions that they want to ask of the physical world or even of the, of the personal world. Uh, so so that's, the, that's the kind of broad context. It's an incredibly emergent field at the moment. Uh, you know, there are experiments and projects going on in the industry, but it's, but it's, it's real green shoots stuff. So you've got, you know, WNYC's Cicada Tracker, um, USA Today has done some incredible investigative stuff around uh, soil well, soil contamination and air contamination, um, ghost factories and uh, the smokestack project, if you want to have a look at those. And of course, you've got weather and sport, which is also, you know, using sensors in, in kind of media and journalistic contexts. Um, so like I said, you know, data journalism, it's a, it's a field that's kind of hungry for more data. Um, and the, the way that we've kind of approached this is um, we're combining research with projects um, actually aimed at audiences and as much as we can partnering with media organisations. Um, and what that we hope does is take the kind of strengths of, of being in Columbia University, an incredible research institution, but also keeping it really linked into what's actually going to be useful and feasible for audiences and media organisations. Um, and it also kind of opens up a whole bunch of networking uh, opportunities. Um, and so, like Taylor said, we ran a workshop in June where we kind of asked the community and some people from adjacent fields, you know, where they thought the potential was, what kind of projects. And out of that came a whole bunch of suggestions for projects, some of which we're actively involved in, some of which we're not. And they kind of range from the quite whimsical and experimental, but still can teach us something about the project. You know, on the whimsical end, you've kind of, we're thinking about putting, well, we are going to put um, accelerometers in people's luggage, a whole range of luggage. So it's kind of a project called The Secret Life of Luggage and we'll kind of understand what happens when you check your bag, you know, which airlines treat it well, which, um, which routes treat it well. Um, it's obviously you know, of interest to people who fly a lot. Um, it's not going to, it's unlikely to bring down a government or anything like that. But it will teach us a lot about the kind of techniques, um, the processes, the feasibility of, of that. Um, slightly less whimsical than that, we're um, developing another project that was actually um, piloted in, in Mark's class by a couple of students, um, which is around strapping accelerometers to dancers. Um, and by doing, by laying data that comes out of those onto over the top of video, we're hoping to give audience is another kind of lens of seeing that something that they already know how to see. And again, the New York Times has done a bit of this kind of stuff in, in a very, very dense way with, um, with uh, Olympians in the What It Takes to Win project. That can also potentially help us illustrate the impact on dancers' bodies. Um, you may be able to illustrate, if not discover, um, uh, uh, you know, what happens to their joints and what that might mean linking it up with a whole lot of other kind of reporting, what that might mean for, for their long-term health um, uh, uh, situation. I'm going long, so I'll, I'll kind of speed up. We're looking at stuff around water use and pollution, um, potentially doing some uh, neighbourhood level quality of life stuff with uh, WNYC, uh, some drone-based photography um, and, and videography stuff. Looking at also this um, 
idea in asking whether we can get kind of accurate head counts um, of aerial photography. You always see, um, you know, at protests you'll see uh, uh, the, the protest organisers say we had 100,000, police might say we had 20,000. It's rare to get a kind of accurate data point. You know, maybe we can kind of graph that through the day as well. That could be interesting. So that's kind of combining sensors but also computer vision so that you're actually using photography as a data source rather than just as a visualisation tool itself. Um, where Taylor and I have been kicking around some ideas for curriculum development which we um, hope that we'll be able to, um, to get up for next semester. Um, and we're also doing some work around the legal and ethical issues that you need to keep in mind if you're keen to do this kind of thing. Um, and if you're coming down to the ONA conference, we'll be doing a, a kind of nice, dense sensor inst installation there. Um, we hope it'll teach us a whole bunch of kind of practical lessons that we can share both with the students um, and the wider digital uh, community and also produce some kind of research that's, that's valuable over the longer term, not just about the exact techniques of, um, of here and now. This is Kristen Nolan, my colleague. Hello. I'm Lara Satrakian, and I wanted to start by asking you to ponder whether there's ever been a story in your career so far that was really your passion project and the story that meant the most to you and called out the best of your talent, spoke to the reason you went into the craft. For me, that was the serious story. I was covering the Middle East for ABC News and Bloomberg Television, covered it all the way through the Arab Spring, and just about when uh, the networks had kind of tired of the story and the spotlight was moving on, um, I didn't feel like it was time to move on because the story kept going. So I kind of wanted to cover that issue with more consistency and clarity, and then I got into some ideas around content architecture. Kristen and our team came together to, to make it happen. But while we were doing that, uh, we were kind of late to the party. There had already been a lot of folks who had felt the same and done the same. Some of them were Columbia J School alums. Actually, the for me at that point, the, the real um, harbinger of, of the trend was Tehran Bureau, a friend of mine called Kelly Niknajad, who was a graduate of the J School, started it in, in my living room in Dubai, and it was a single subject website dedicated to the Iran crisis, because, you know, same sort of reasons. And so, over time, we noticed this was a trend, and we approached Taylor, and he helped us, you know, figure out really what, what and how uh, we kind of scope a project, a research project, around this phenomenon of the single subject news network. So what Chris and I ended up doing is we devised a way that we're going to bring together what we believe to be the 20 best examples of single subject journalism, of focused news platforms, into a network, the single subject news network. We're going to be studying the space, you know, how you define it, what makes the difference between a blog and an online publisher, what makes for a single subject news site, what has made them successful, what explains their peaks and troughs, what makes them sustainable, and then coalesce and synthesize their best practices. As Taylor mentioned, we'll be hosting a conference at the Tau Center for those 20 publishers from around the world, November 8th to 10th. You're all welcome to be there. It'll be really, really interesting. And when we talk about, we're like not officially allowed quite to say who's in that group, but when you look it's at the coming. landscape, it's coming. But when you look at the landscape of what's out there, you look at Homicide Watch and the impact they've had at highlighting violent crime in Washington. You look at SCOTUS blog and how one man with a passion for all things Supreme Court really turned that into the key resource for all things Supreme Court. And in times like these, where Syria went from being page seven news to front page news, our website and others at times of peak interest do become a resource and help what I, what I always set out to do, they help, they help accomplish, which is to hack the news cycle. How do you get more knowledge into the knowledge pool? Because otherwise we're really thinly staffed across the board when it comes to any one of these issues. They need context, they need consistency, and those of us who are really, really dedicated to that one issue tend to pull those together with a certain professionalism. And I imagine in this room you're probably going to end up sprouting one or more single subject websites of your own at some point. 
So hopefully when we do put that research together, it'll be your kind of go-to guide for how to do it with style and uh, sort of sustainable edge. Kristen, do you want to pipe anything in? Yeah, sure. Um, I, don't, I don't have much to add to that because that's a pretty good introduction to what we're trying to do. But um, as Fergus said, really the point of this is to bring academia and practicum together and talk about best practices moving forward, talk about people's ideas. And as Laura just said, I'm sure that many of you in the room will kind of foray into this field. And if you have those ideas, I mean, contact us. We'd love to hear your ideas about what you want to do moving forward and whether you think that this is a viable option for journalism. And what, you know, as Taylor said earlier, you know, what we've discovered is that it kind of is. I mean, the more, the less people that are around in, you know, foreign bureaus or domestic bureaus or focusing on certain things, I mean, look at Politico, look at any of these sites that are really trendsetters, and they're trendsetters because people want that news and they want it in depth, and it's just not cutting it in mainstream media at this time. So that's kind of what we're doing, and it'll be really exciting November 8th through 10th. Come join us. We don't just, we don't just study the dog food, we eat it. We are at Syria Deeply, we're already looking at how you do Arctic Deeply, Myanmar Deeply, Congo Deeply, Alzheimer's Deeply, Autism Deeply, and that's not just because we want to grow as a startup, but because we really think there's a future there. And we're figuring out how do you serve an audience and make it sustainable when you go deep. And uh, hopefully we'll come up with some answers, so. Thanks, guys. stairs in this place. Um, Nick, Nick is going to talk a bit about computational. Oh, yeah. great. There's a, you're, not, you're not on my written schedule, but that's fine. Um, and the next, so so, so one, of, one of the other things that we have going on at the Tau Centre, as well as these actual pro projects, are we have Tau Fellows. Um, and we have three Tau Fellows at the moment, and we're going to be adding to that um, in terms of people who are working with us and bringing other people into the school. Nick Dicopoulos is one of those. Uh, Nick is a computer scientist by background, but has actually been looking a lot at uh, computational journalism um, over the past five or six years. Come long time. Um, and he is going to talk to you a little bit about his work and also uh, a series that we'll be doing here at the school. So come on up. Thanks, Emily. Um, yeah, so I'm Nick Diakopoulos and I just wanted to come up here quick and uh, do a little bit of a pitch for um, something we're organizing at the Tau Center. Uh, this year related to computational journalism. So we're actually organizing a speaker series. Um, we're inviting in uh, some of the top-notch researchers uh, who are doing interesting work at the intersection of technology and news uh, and journalism. Um, and uh, this Thursday, actually, um, if you're available, you should come, 6.30 p.m. We have Ethan Zuckerman uh, visiting from MIT. And he's going to be talking a little bit about um, civic media, news, technology. Uh, they're building lots of interesting new uh, tools that, that combine these things at MIT. He'll talk about some of those things. Uh, and so uh, go to towcenter.org, uh, click on the blog. There'll be a blog post there with, with links to RSCP and so on for Thursday. Um, later this semester, we have Jeff Hare, uh, October 30th. Uh, if you do any data-driven journalism, you'll know uh, D3 is the big visualization platform that people use. Uh, Jeff uh, co-invented that, so he'll be talking about uh, data wrangling, data visualization, uh, and these kinds of projects. He's a researcher, he's a professor at University of Washington. Uh, and then in November, November 14th, we have, uh, we're flying someone in all the way from um, Doha, Qatar. Uh, his name's Carlos Castillo, and he does really interesting research uh, at the intersection of data mining and social media. So uh, the big question for social media and journalism is credibility. How do you find information uh, in that breaking news story that's credible. And Carlos has done some really amazing work uh, data mining that information for journalists. So he'll be in speaking uh, in November. Um, otherwise, uh, feel free to, to come chat with me more about computational journalism. As Emily said, I've been thinking about this for several years. I uh, have lots of, lots of ideas. Um, love, would love to collaborate on, on projects with students and so on. Uh, and uh, with that, I will turn it back to Emily. Finally, just say that, just say that um, I'm going to make Shivani come up because uh, she's going to tell you uh, just again how you can 
this is very sort of we're giving we're firing lots of things at you uh, so you'll be feeling very exhausted now because we're not really expecting you to do any work this semester we only want you to attend tower events um, unless you're in my class in which case you will be doing work uh, Shivani um, I want you to meet because uh, she is the person who you will see most of around the school and who you should pester about all of these things and then she can uh, pester myself and uh, Taylor um, to, uh, do, to, to respond or to, or to make your ideas uh, come true. And Shivani's going to give you a series of uh, ways in which you can sort of practically uh, talk to us and get in touch with us. So. Hi, everyone. Um, I am guessing a few of you have emailed me. I've got like a dozen emails from some of you. And if you haven't emailed me, Emily's right. Pester me, email me, um, follow me on Twitter, ask me questions about events, um, and I will answer them for you. Uh, so I have a um, couple of events. Oh, that is not mine. Um, lined up over here. Uh, the first one is what Nick was talking about. It is the evening with Ethan Zuckerman. Um, all of you should come to this event. We have limited seats, and there are still seats available. So if you haven't already RSVP'd, uh, do go to towcenter.org slash calendar, and all our events are there. Um, and there's a link to how you can RSVP over there. Um, and then we have a Tao tea uh, on October 2nd. This year we're doing something new where we are actually teaching people skills in our Tao teas, which we didn't do last year. Um, so if you're interested in learning how to create Google Fusion tables and you don't want to take Susan's class uh, for a semester to do that, uh, you <laughs> I took Susan's class, I loved it. <laughs> but <laughs> um, you should come to that. Um, so. And then the next one is a Tao Tea with Mark Courtney. Um, if you don't know him, you should Google him. Um, and just check out our calendar for all the events. Um, and I know we have been very full. All our Tao Teas have been sold out so far, and a lot of you have not been able to come. Um, but since you are here, this is a secret. Um, do come to the door. If we have open seats, we will let you in, uh, as we have done for the last two Tao Teas. Um, other than that, we are always looking for bloggers, um, people to cover events. If you go out on a hackathon, you want to write about it, shoot me an email. Um, it would be, it will go up on the Tao blog. It will be a great chance for you to get published. Um, and if you have ideas on speakers, if you want to speak to Emily or Taylor or Susan about something, you could still shoot me an email if you can't get hold of them. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Oh. Um, one more thing which Susan did ask me to tell you guys is about the Innovation Showcase next semester. Um, so I think we only started this from last year, am I right? Two years. Uh, so this has been two years and every year at the end of the academic school, at the end of the year we have an Innovation Showcase where we showcase student work uh, to the public, to your parents, to all kinds of people who come to the school. Um, so you might want to start thinking about what you want to have showcased in that event. Uh, a lot of it was class projects that people did last year, um, and it was great. Uh, there's a link to it on our blog again, and you can see the stuff that was uh, presented in our uh, innovation showcase last year. So that's it. that I was going to forget. Um, uh, so uh, thank you, uh, Emily and, and company. That, that was um, awesome. I, I get to uh, close the evening and uh, tell you a little about the projects that, um, that Brown has uh, funded this year. Um, we have a regular funding cycle. So um, you'll see our, our call for proposals will come out um, uh, uh, middle of March or so, um, and everything should be decided by the middle to end of April. So it kind of fits in with your um, with your sort of larger uh, uh, um, uh, career planning. Um, I think uh, the end the the uh, the job fair is the end of March. So this sort of fits in. Um, the as I said before, we offer uh, two kinds of 
funds as well as sort of small startup things. Um, one is a, a set of fellowships, um, and then the second is a set of magic grants, and they're mostly, as I said, meant to be startup funds. Um, I thought what we would do is have five minutes each for, um, I think it was four uh, magic grant projects and two fellow projects, so you get to see a broad, a broad sense of what it is that, um, that it, what it is that uh, that we do. Uh, the first is a magic grant, um, Madeline and Matthias. Um, this was uh, uh, a grant one of the, from our first round of funding last year, um, and uh, I'll let them describe. Um, so, so this project is now fairly advanced, um, uh, and I'll let them describe where, where it is and where it's at, um, after which we'll do uh, City Beat, and then uh, Nick, you're up. So, Madeline, Matthias. Hi, uh, I'm Madeline Ross. I was an, in your seats last year. I was doing the MS program here. I'm now at SEPA finishing my dual degree. And Matthias is now doing his PhD in computer science here. Yeah. Um, and so our team was across both Columbia and Stanford. And we were working on a project called Dispatch. Um, so as multiple people have told you tonight, and as you well know yourselves, um, Citizen journalism is a growing trend, especially in areas where journalism and activism, the lines being blurred between the two. Um, at the same time, uh, the world is becoming maybe more dangerous for those citizen journalists because they don't have as much training or support for when people surveil them and whether it's government, whether it's other actors. Um, they often may be compromising their own safety or their source's safety. And in recent time, even in the US and in places that we think of as having a lot of freedom of speech and, and actually good protections for the press we've seen, the New Yorker has launched Strong, Strongbox, which is a system based on Tor to help protect their sources. The US government was revealed to have secretly spied on associated press phones. And um, then recently, the NSA has been revealed to be reading lots and lots and lots of emails. Um, so our project was to try to find a way to help journalists, both professionals and citizens, report in a way that was protective of both their own safety and their sources. Um, so the first goal of our project was to raise awareness of security among journalists. And then we actually built a mobile app called Dispatch, which works on iOS and Android, which provides end-to-end -end encryption for both publishing and communication. And Matthias will talk a little bit more. So to give you a quick overview of what we, of what we built during this year, uh, this is a screenshot of the, I think, former version of our uh, iOS app. Uh, so what we do is basically uh, all, all the encryption happens on your, on your phone, and then uh, we have a server that routes the messages you want to send either to other people, to, to other journalists, to sources, uh, or for, for publishing. Uh, we just write the encrypted message, so even if someone listens on uh, the network or the server, uh, they just see encrypted data. And then uh, when it's delivered, it's decrypted on the phone of the recipient or directly published for you. Uh, so here we were using Tumblr for publication because we were working with them. Uh, but it's, it's kind of platform independent, so we could uh, hook it up to any, any publishing, even an internal publishing server in a newsroom, for instance. Uh, we also added a, a pretty cool feature that we, we call the sneaker net uh, that allows you to, ex to exchange, so still the encrypted data, uh, picture, message, uh, locally over Bluetooth with uh, people you were at a protest with, if you don't have a network uh, available, for instance. Uh, so you, you spread your encrypted message to as many people as possible, and uh, when one gets out of the uh, non-network area, they upload it for you, and it's still encrypted and signed uh, with, uh, with your key, so it can be traced back to your virtual identity so that you can just build trust with uh, whatever you, you publish. Um, so we took Dispatch to several conferences where we had papers accepted. Uh, most recently, SIGCOM in Hong Kong, the WWW 2013 conference in Rio, and um, NICAR, which is the Investigative Journalist Conference. Um, and we're able to get a lot of feedback from both the technolo technologists and also journalists. Um, 
the next stage of dispatch now. So our funding cycle is over, um, and Matias is now working on his PhD. One of our other developers has gone to LinkedIn. Um, so what we're working on now is collaborating with media organizations to get them to take our technology in-house and host it on their own servers so that um, with something like NSA, uh, whereas they can go in a back door with Gmail or something like that, if it's actually hosted on the organization server, they have to go to them, in which case you can just shut it down. So that's dispatch. <laughs> Uh, all right, as Madeline said, this was one of our, our first grants, and it's um, now in its second year, and we're carrying over funding slightly to, to sort of tie things up. Um, our, our, our funding round for this year has just started, so the new grants have started in September. Um, and the first uh, the first project you'll hear is from Raj Schwartz, who uh, is partnering with, who started at Cornell and is now at, sorry, started at Rutgers and now is at Cornell, has partnered with the New York World. Um, and so this is a project with the New York World. Raz. So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, so actually, I, I never sat here or in this building. Um, my background is from sociology and human-computer interaction. And then, um, as Mark said, I'm now at Cornell. So I'm spending a lot of time with computer scientists. And this year, I'm going to spend a lot of time with journalists, which is great. And just you know, meeting these like, completely different crowds and making them work together. That's really exciting. And this is kind of like what we're doing here at CityBeat. Uh, and CityBeat is a project uh, that we just started. Um, uh, so yeah, we're uh, the second cycle of, uh, of uh, the Magic Grant. Um, CityBeat is, is designed to be a, a multi-platform application for newsrooms and journalists uh, to source, monitor, and analyze social media data from cities in real time. Uh, so. As probably all of you know, social media is not only Miley Cyrus videos and lolcats. You can also s learn stuff from that. So we saw all kinds of projects that took social media data and tried to uh, uh, um, find new insights about cities, about behavior of people. And what we're trying to do in CityBit this, uh, in, in this project is to source uh, uh, all these uh, streams of information from Instagram and Twitter and Foursquare and get all this data in real time to extract uh, uh, meaningful insights that journalists can take and, and act upon. So uh, we're just starting. Uh, as Mark said, we're working together with uh, the New York World. So uh, I think that's a very important part of the project that taking uh, uh, um, to have the journalists to take a very active part in designing and making this application uh, as useful as possible for journalists, uh, making, uh, trying to make sense of a city uh, and also find the stories that can be useful for them. So we're working with, in, 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 with uh, some we, we're working with uh, journalists at the New York World, uh, and we also have a computer science, uh, scientist from Rutgers that are helping us with that. Um, and we're, during this year, we're going to uh, gather requirements from uh, journalists, not only in the New York world, but also other uh, newsrooms. And then we de will develop uh, several platforms that will display this data. So this is an, uh, a mock-up version of the mobile app, but there will also be an ambient display um, uh, meant to be installed in newsrooms, a desktop version that uh, journalists can actually uh, look for data and search for specific geographical regions uh, in, in real time. Um, so uh, we hope that by the end of the year, we'll uh, deploy it in uh, between seven to 10 newsrooms across the country. Uh, and uh, if you want to find out more information and you want to uh, be kept in the loop, uh, you can go to our website and sign up for a news, uh, newsletter, uh, thecitybeat.org. Thank you. Uh, I, sh I should add, too, that uh, CityBeat and one other project, the Declassification Engine, which you'll hear about in a second, um, are both uh, co-sponsored. So we're splitting uh, the support with the Brown, uh, with the Tau Center. So there's a lot of sort of overlap and collaboration between the groups. Um, so those are so those were two uh, uh, magic grants. Um, next, you'll hear from uh, Nick, who's uh, uh, a uh, Brown Fellow this year. Nick.
Hi everyone, so my name is Nicholas Jubel. I am a second year degree, dual degree student here in the Computer Science uh, Journalism program. Uh, I'm also a Brown Fellow now. My fellowship has just started. Uh, and I am from Brazil, so I wanted to do my project on, uh, on something uh, that has the uh, potential to ha uh, generate a great impact on Brazilian society. Uh, and then I decided to look at the uh, Brazilian equivalent of the uh, Freedom of Information Act. So here in the U USA, uh, FOIA dates back to 1966, but we in Brazil have just had uh, a law on the matter enacted, so our law came into effect in 2012. That means uh, there has been very little research done on this project. Uh, so then I came up with my proposal, which is to uh, develop an automatic request generator uh, along the lines of what the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press does here in the US. So then journalists and ordinary citizens can just come to our platform and fill out a very simple form and we will generate the appropriate uh, request form that users can then turn to government, uh, get data, and then once they have uh, data from the government, they can come back to the platform and upload it so that uh, it's shared to everyone else and people don't have to submit multiple requests to get the same data. Uh, so we also manage return documents. Uh, this platform will contain uh, not only the, the uh, request machine, but also the uh, also stories on FOIA. So we, uh, we want to report on the effectiveness of uh, access of our law is called access to information law. Um, so, uh, and we also want to raise awareness about the law, which is a very brand new law. So people in Brazil know very little about uh, the existence of the law or the provisions of the law. So uh, the platform that I will be working on is really meant to foster the provisions of the law. Uh, we would, uh, the platform will be open for anyone who wants to uh, report on the access of information law in Brazil to publish. So if you guys have any interest in the topic, keep in touch and once it goes up, probably somewhere at some point in the spring, come talk to me and it would be great to publish your stories on our platform. Thank you. So with that, as I said, we, um, we, we're interested in, in story and Nick will be writing a story about FOIA on FOIA basically, when people get to make requests, what do they request? Um, Next we have um, the declassification engine. Um, Andy and Sasha, are you, where is Sasha sitting? Ah, there you are, great. Um, again, this, was a, this was, came from an event that, uh, that uh, had taken place, uh, that we had co-sponsored, um, but now is a, a project uh, that involves uh, history, computer science, journalism, a, a fairly broad spectrum. Um, and your sites are just on the back. We just get straight to the sites. Okay, absolutely. Okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Andy Dixon. I'm a PhD student in communications here at the J School. Um, and this is Sasha Rush, one of my colleagues. He's a PhD student in, com in computer science at GSAS. Um, and we're both working on the declassification engine um, project with the supervision of Professor uh, Matt Connolly, who is in, um, let's see. Professor Matthew Connolly, who's um, in international and global history, and Professor David Madigan of statistics. Um, and we'd like to share a bit about our project with you tonight. So because we're so short on time, what I'll do is I'll describe the problem our project is meant to address, and then describe the project itself, um, and then hand things over to Sasha so that way he can demo some of the tools. Um, though for more information, including the Prezi presentation, which is pretty thorough, which introduces our project, you can visit this website, declassification-engine.org. Um, so to start, and I'll make this a little bit bigger. So um, to start the project, our project addresses 
is the increasingly huge trove of official documents withheld from the public scholarly and journalistic scrutiny by U.S. government agencies even decades after their initial classification. And the volume of documents has become untenable with the National Archives estimating that just one intelligence agency produces a petabyte, that's one million gigabytes, of classified information every 18 months. Um, the review of this much material will require two million people working full time um, for a year, and the current backlog of materials requiring review, plus the tens of petabytes that are already generated every year, could fully occupy every state and federal employee full time year round. Um, moreover, billions of dollars are being spent by the federal government to keep this material secret. Um, last year, $10 billion were spent on maintaining the secrecy of these documents, while a mere $50 million were spent on declassification efforts. Um, the National Archives and the National Declassification Center, they don't have the staff or the budget um, to keep up, even as material is being routinely destroyed to prevent retention by these various agencies. Um, so traditional research methods are ill-equipped to manage these documents to ensure government accountability. Um, however, we hope to discover ways to manage these, this material with the use of new computer-based research methods, and this is the work of the Declassification Engine Project. Um, this project makes use of natural language processing and statistical and machine learning to explore the historical record, um, to challenge dominant historical narratives, and for revealing patterns of official secrecy. Um, and in particular, we hope to attribute authorship to orphaned and anonymous documents, to characterize attributes of redacted text, and to model patterns in diplomatic communications. Um, moreover, our work offers a platform for the assessment and improvement of these digital tools as a declassification device. And longer term, we hope to create a cloud-based virtual archive for these tools and projects and to invite collaboration um, from scholars, journalists, and other researchers. So let us know if you're interested in our project. Um, but in the meantime, we're linking to smaller projects that arise from this core work and from our website. Um, um, we're linking to them from our website. So Sasha is going to demonstrate some of those tools for you now. Hi, everyone. Um, so these are two of the tools that we've worked on over the past couple of months. Um, this first one is a, a project I worked on that for now we're calling the Redaction Archive. And basically what happened here was we were given access to a large trove of documents released as part of mandatory declassification requests. And um, these were given to us in both digital and kind of in image form. And with these documents, we found that we were able to match up documents that had been declassified by different parts of the United States government over different periods of time. Um, and when you do that, you can find um, these kind of uh, aligned documents such that a redaction may occur, say, in one document but not in the other document itself. Um, and when you do that, you can get the, the text that was originally um, kind of redacted in one of the documents or the other. And we think this is pretty interesting because it gives you a kind of unique window into the process of this declassification process and exactly um, what text was or was not left out by um, kind of declassification agencies at different points. Um, all in all, you can, there's about, um, I think, over 5,000 of these online, and you can look through them and um, kind of see what's going on. Um, so, oh, back then, great. On this one. Let's click on it. Um, the second um, project we've been working on is a visualization tool for um, a set of cables that was released by the National Archive. So this was one of the larger kind of dumps of declassified information. These are State Department cables from uh, 1973 to 1976. And there's about 1.5 million of these with uh, full text. Uh, and this visualization here is actually um, based on a visualization from uh, the Google Creative Lab. Uh, they originally uh, built it for arms trafficking, um, but actually had quite a sparse data set. Uh, and this is kind of re-employing that visualization for classifications going between different State Department agencies uh, from uh, 1973 and 1976. 
and I think, uh, let's see if I can figure this out. Um, and you can kind of, yeah, look at this in terms of different time periods and um, different levels of classified or confidential cables. So you can play with these tools on our website at declassificationengine.org. Thanks. All right, we have two more to present, and I hope what you're getting a sense of is that what, what the Brown Institute is about is trying to bridge, make some connections, right? Whether it's uh, between computer science and journalism, between different parts of campus. Um, so, uh, uh, and again, the declassification engine like CityBeat is, uh, is uh, also uh, half funded by the, the, Tau, uh, the, the Tau Center. Um, next, we have our second uh, fellow for this year. Um, Kate, are you? Yep, uh, who will speak about her project, and then we'll close with um, a project from a documentary film student here. Okay. Thanks. So as Mark said, I am a fellow. I'm also a fifth-year PhD student in communications here at the J School. We're down in the basement. Um, and I am also a former journalist. I worked as a radio reporter for about 11 years. And while I was working as a reporter, I was always wondering about things like impact, like Taylor was talking about before. Um, I was wondering whether the stories I was doing um, were the stories that would have the most impact, whether the people I was talking to, my sources, were the best people to talk to about the, the subjects that I was interested in, in presenting in my stories. And, um, so that kind of led me here to the J School, where I could ask these kinds of questions and, and do actual research on these sorts of things. So, so what I'm interested in now is how are journalists using um, newer, they're still fairly new, digital tools to find sources and, uh, and how does that affect the way that, that news is done? So um, something that I'm looking at in particular is the idea of findability, the fact that there's so much more data out there than there used to be, that is so much uh, easier to access and, and what that does to the process of news gathering. So um, a lot of past research in this area, which has been done by sociologists for the most part, um, on who is a source and, and why they're a source, um, much of that research has found well, public officials are the most common type of source out there, and there are lots of reasons for that. But one of those reasons is that they're very findable. Um, this is what Governor Cuomo's calendar. You can see where he is every day. So if you're a journalist and uh, you want to go out there and see what he's doing or you want a chance to talk to him, uh, today, for instance, he was in Nassau County. So we know that. Um, we know public officials make themselves very findable, very available. They send out their calendars. They send out press releases about announcements that they're going to make, et cetera. But um, now more people are more findable. Um, you might remember after the Boston bombing, some of the first information that we uh, got about who exactly is this guy, um, Jehar Tsarnaev, uh, came from his Twitter feed. Once reporters found out that this was his Twitter feed, then we started to see, oh, this is what he was tweeting about. Oh, he was actually tweeting after the bombing happened, and this is what he said. So this is how we sort of started to build um, you know, the profile of, of what we knew about this guy. And this happens a lot in reporting. Um, you might be doing this yourselves when you're interested in learning more about a person. You say, okay, is this person on Twitter? What do they say on Twitter? What does their Facebook profile look like? So I'm interested in looking at um, how this affects the reporting process because, of course, before Twitter, before Facebook, the reporting process was, was different. So, um, and in addition to, to these tools, these social media outlets that I mentioned, um, there are other tools that are being developed. You already heard about CityBeat, um, mining social media data. Um, and there are other projects out there as well. Geofedia is also based on social media, um, trying to look for trends there. Storyful uses um, Twitter lists to, to try to find news as it's breaking. Um, the Public Insight Network is used by a lot of newsrooms, especially um, public radio, public television stations, um, asking anyone who wants to, to submit information about what they know, what are you an expert in, and sort of self-identify uh, your areas of interest and your areas of expertise so that reporters can then search for you by keyword and, and contact you and, and find out what you know about the subject. So I'm looking at some of these tools um, that have been developed and are being developed now and asking questions about, okay, now that these tools are available, 
Um, how are they affecting the reporting process? Um, how do they affect the stories that journalists choose to write about? How do they affect the sources that journalists um, choose to go to? And how does it affect what we actually know about these sources? How are we putting together the profiles of these people who are writing about? And importantly, who are we still leaving out? There is a scholar, uh, there is a scholar, Gay Tuckman, who um, came up with this metaphor of the news net. Journalists cast the news net and see who they can draw in using the tools that they have available to them. Well, some people still fall through the holes in that net, so what do we do to find them? So those are the types of questions that I'm looking at, and if you um, want to talk to me further about it or have any questions, feel free to contact me. Thanks. All right, um, thank you for holding out, y'all. Um, uh, our last project this evening um, is again a, a, a student in the documentary film program. I guess he's set to graduate in December, is that the? Um, uh, pairing uh, with a, uh, an information studies student who's now doing a postdoc at uh, Microsoft Research, actually. Um, so, Adam. Hello. Um, my partner and I are always the last people to present for the Brown Institute. I like to think of us as like the surprise cliffhanger ending for the Brown Institute, but also one that we tout as um, the story-driven project that the Institute is funding in this cycle. Um, as Mark said, I'm a soon-to-be graduating documentary film student in June Cross's class. Um, and I started doing a documentary about a year ago on the renaissance of drag culture in Bushwick, Brooklyn, that began about two years ago. And there is a new drag festival that had just had its second year uh, last two weekends ago. Um, so as I was doing this project, I noticed some interesting trends going on in the community. Um, I noticed specifically that there was a bifurcation of identity that was happening and happening extremely uniquely in digital spaces. Um, so the project universally explores the idea of identity curation um, in which we all get, make a lot of choices about the face that we present in the virtual world. So say I have a LinkedIn profile and a Facebook and I'm presenting two completely distinct facets of who I am and constructing my identity in completely unique ways. Um, and drag queens, it would seem, do the same exact thing, but in a much more visually stark, obviously, way. So this is uh, Elemento Pei. During the, during the day, this is Elliot, and Elliot is a dancer for the Metropolitan Opera and uses Facebook in a lot of ways, one of which is to get jobs as a dancer. So he makes this really distinct differentiation between the two facets of his identity. Um, so the other element that we're looking at is the way that subculture and uh, dominant forms of modern technology interact with each other. So our project involves creating first a digital archive in which we will take images and media data which is being produced in huge unfathomable quantities from this community and upload them into an archive in which they'll be organized by performer, by venue, by nightlife goer. And then we'll take information from the archive and we'll source it into a physical immersive installation in which anybody can go and walk into a person's multiple or bifurcated identity in which you can immerse yourself completely in the kind of idea that we have multiple selves now more than ever as a result of these virtual spaces in which we render ourselves. Um, so we'll be working with a developer for the archive and we'll work with an architect for the installation and hopefully there will be a designer somewhere involved as we kind of like to look at this as a partnership between technology, um, story, and also aesthetic because I think that that is sort of a often missing element but also one that as we work together in these partnerships becomes increasingly crucial because who wants to use or engage with a piece of technology that's not pretty? Um, and who, who's gonna go see a drag queen that's not putting on her face right? Um, that's pretty much the extent of our project. Thank you so much.
All right, thank you. Um, what, what Adam meant by the story driven is that um, uh, a lot of the projects that we funded this year or the last two years have been technology leading to stories, declassification engine leading to a series of stories. Um, in the case of Bushwood, we have a, uh, a story that didn't fit comfortably in any kind of, in the, the existing sort of techno technological framework and so spurred the creation of new technology. Right, so there's that kind of spectrum there that you might draw it, um, that uh, we're trying to, to locate funding along. So um, with that, I, I, actually we're, we're on time. We, we, we can open up for some questions um, for Emily and I um, uh, or anyone. Um, are, are there any questions at, at this point? Yes. Yeah, so uh, the, the data group, that the informal data group that's spun up, we're gonna try to have some, you know, keep that going. Um, it, it's, someone is gonna put a doodle poll up eventually and get a time for us to meet. But I think through that, we'll be, we'll be doing some of that. And as, as you heard, the Tau Ts are, are also going to have um, some components of training in them as, as well. Yeah. And if it turns out there, there's like something that you'd like to see or there's a gap that's not being filled, come talk to us. We're very open to helping organize things, providing, you know, I mean, everything from, from bringing a particular expert in to a workshop or what have you. I mean, we're, we're here to, to channel a lot of the energy that's in this room. Because I think, in particular, the Brown Institute works best when we're, when we're sort of coming from you all. Other questions? Yeah. Right. So, so the question is, how far along should the idea be? Um, I think that depends on the. Um, I mean, what we're looking for, at least. Uh, so, so our our process will collect applications in the middle of March or so, and then there'll be a series of screenings um, where they're. Uh, I'll invite some groups, uh, a panel basically, to help evaluate what the proposals look like, and really what they're looking lo looking for is in a year's time, do you have the expertise to get done what you has, have described you need to get done? And um, it, are things sort of sufficiently, um, ideas sufficiently coherent and fleshed out that, that, that there is a place you're gonna get to, right? So it doesn't have to, in, in some cases, like in the case of City Beat, there was a lot of work that had been done already. In other cases, like Bushwick, there was very little of the technical work that had been done. The, the, there was the work behind the, the documentary film, but the other work was, is, still yet, is still yet to happen. So I think it's a question of, you know, given the resources we're providing, does it seem feasible that you'll get to where you wanna, wanna be in a year? And we do also have options for um, sort of smaller grants that we can give to help seed things, like sort of pre-seed <laughs> funding. So that can, that can help you along as well.
absolutely. I mean, that, that um, while we have a, a, a definite funding cycle what, that's trying to match your plans for the following year, um, and, and I think we're going to try it that grants can either start in June or September, depending upon what's best for you. But while we have like a regular cycle, we're very much open to talking at, at any time. Just come in my office and we'll, you know, we can talk about how you, how we get from here to there. We, we also, Brown has also hosted a few events that specifically try to do that kind of matchmaking so that if you have a great idea but aren't quite sure about how to get something implemented. Um, although I have to say that the, the best projects are less, I, you know, I've got a great idea, you know, I need to find an implementer, or, you know, I have something implemented, I need to find a problem, right? But it's more about a kind of authentic, authentic, you know, um, collaboration, which often requires some time to build up some vocabulary, that kind of thing. And so we host events that try to, to bring sort of technology types and journalism types together to, to create that shared vocabulary where new things can start to, to emerge. Is that, okay. other questions? Absolutely, I think that would be, <laughs> I can't imagine anyone who would turn that away. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. But yeah, you know, yes, absolutely, and yes. There's, there's, there's all manner of stuff. I think we can offer everything from, from city beat to drag, so depending upon where you want to get involved, we have the, yeah. All right, one last question, yeah. So, so Brown was, the, the, the magic grants in particular are supposed to be thought of as a kind of seed funding. So here is something that you can go off and, you know, um, you know maybe you start this up into something. I mean, uh, again, also, uh, part of our emphasis is on, on the story. So if in the end what you, what you end up doing is telling a great story, that's a good end as well. But, but I think um, our, the original, I think Helen's original idea was that this was kind of, this was, this was a bit like startup funding, but in a, you know, in a very particular, in a very particular context. Yeah, we have, um, again, sort of, uh, the, the life beyond these projects, and we are more, if you like, tout us the more traditional uh, research and publishing, that we're trying to make that as innovative as, as we can. So, for instance, you know, both Ferguson and, and, and um, Lauren Christen's workshops are that way of kind of actually making the whole research process a bit more um, engaging uh, and giving us different materials to, 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 to publish. So the idea with kind of most tower 
to be part of what we think is an evolving ecosystem. Um, and as I say, there are all sorts of connections that you can make here, which, which will hopefully help, help, help me on that. Um, but there are, there are Mark's program is you know, very creative, story-oriented. You can you can go to, to, to Brown with a kind of a, a sort of a crazy idea and see it sort of come to life in front of your eyes. Uh, at Tau, it's more kind of, you know, what exactly is going on out there, what we think the next thing is going to be, and how should we describe that, uh, and how can we evolve journalists in that, in that sort of research about it. So it's kind of, you know, there's a kind of a, a logic in terms of how those things fit together, um, and, you know, there are different, that they will appeal to different people, and they, but, but it does mean that almost any idea that you have, and that you want to put into practice, at some point we can hunt it. Not any idea. The typology and with the typology of ideas we will we will close the evening. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>